All right, guys, so here we are, Irate Gamer Season 2 coming at you, and this time period spans from the end of 2007 all the way to mid-2008, right after the summertime. And this was a very weird time for the show, for me as a as a personality, because I was trying to feel my way into the character, and you know, I, I was the, be the best actor back then. I still, I watch these episodes, and I'm like, ugh. I, if they make me cringe, I want to just go back and re-edit all these things. But this is a time period where I was still kind of like the Frankenstein reviewer. You know, I, I had taken so many pieces from other different reviewers to make the irate gamer that I was still feeling out my character. I'm like, okay, well, what makes me tick? Uh, what, How am I going to make my show different from everybody else's? And... You know, this time period, you can really see it. You know, I'm, I'm throwing things at the wall, seeing what sticks, what doesn't. You know, I'm bringing in new characters. Ronnie shows up for the very first time in episode 12. And I was trying to get get away from the first season. Uh, and that's why I ended it uh, where I did kind of early, not, you know, a full year. Uh, it was because, you know, I, I wanted to start a new chapter. I just been featured twice on YouTube, which was, you get featured once, that was great, but no one had ever been featured twice, and this upset a lot of people, and I had so much hate coming my way, and of course, add that to the hate I already got from uh, being featured the first time, which I was ranked in subscriber rank, uh, number 150, and once I was featured that first time, I rose up through the ranks to number two. I surpassed everybody else, and boy, I tell you what, it just caused a shit storm. Every one of those reviewers that I surpassed, they turned against me, they turned their fans against me, and I had all this adversity thrown at me, which, you know, in hindsight, it actually contributed to the popularity of the channel because there's just so much controversy surrounding it. I think that's part and parcel of how the show became so popular and stayed popular, even though, you know, haters were a huge part of that success. So it was kind of weird, the double double edged sword that I had to deal with. Uh, plus, you know, a lot of them were trying to get under my skin. They're trying to get me to come out publicly against James and all these other people. And I just wouldn't do it. And I think that really pissed them off even more because I stayed silent uh, throughout this entire period. I mean, I'd make jabs here and there, but for the most part, I would not come out and just say, I hate this guy or that guy. And I know that's what people wanted, but I didn't feel that way. I didn't want to feel, I didn't want to feed into the drama because that's not who I was. I just wanted to do a show, put it out there, and entertain people. That's that's all I wanted to do. And I think a lot of haters lost sight of that and lost sight of themselves in the process. But yeah, this was a weird time period for myself. I was trying to find my own voice. And eventually I think I found it. Uh, I, I went through a real growth period during this time. And I think by the Rob the Robot episode aired, I had figured it out. I mean, the Rob the Robot episode is just a cut above the rest of the episodes in series two because uh, the acting is better, the dialogue, the narration is better. And I had to, uh, uh, you know, I, I started to put on that blue outfit, which uh, was kind of bagging on me. I wish I would have got a more form-fitting outfit. I'm not sure how many people consider season two their favorite. I certainly don't <laughs> I do because I, I just see all the growing pains I'm trying to find my own voice, but you know, I eventually found it. Uh, yeah, I relied heavily on storylines and uh, interacting with sprites and game animations and special effects, and that's kind of where I was going with the show. And I, like I said, I think with by the end of the season, everything gelled in season three. That's where the whole show just kind of came together. All right, so here we are with the first episode of season two, Zombies Ate My Neighbors, and. The only reason I reviewed this game was because I wanted a good Halloween title to review to usher in the holiday. I love Halloween. And look in hindsight, looking back on it, it's probably not the best title to review in the angry manner because it was a pretty good game. Uh, and here I was trying to trash it. Uh, the problem was, you know, the games I, I would have loved to review was uh, Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the 13th, but I didn't want to touch those because uh, James... Uh, the angry video game nerd, I felt did a great job with his episodes. And, you know, even though people were calling me a copycat, there were certain games that I just would not touch because he did such a good job on that. I'm like, no, they're off limits. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. So that was my own personal uh, way of looking at things. I'm like, so I wanted Zombies Ate My Neighbors. And <laughs> if you watch the episode, it's very short. There's just a lot of filler. And that's because I, I, I was looking. I was like, oh, what am I going to rant on with this one? So... A lot of filler, especially with this is the first appearance of Ronnie. And it's very funny because Ronnie has become 
a fan favorite of amongst my fans and his first episode his debut episode a lot of people it was funny they're like yeah we like ronnie but what else you got they did not like ronnie so i kept i'm like okay let me do this again and fans i think warmed up to him over time because i just kept putting him into funny situations so i'm, I'm glad that whole thing panned out because you know ronnie is just such an integral part of the show now i i don't know how you could do the show without him uh, another character that really came into his own is the evil gamer now it's funny because when I first created Evil Gamer, which he showed up in Super Mario Brothers, it was just a throwaway gag that I never thought I'd run with. Now, I had him come back in the Yonoid episode and he was hanging out with Satan. And again, you know, here he is coming back again in this episode. And like I said, I was trying to figure out ways to try to make my show different from everybody else's. And I'm like, okay, well, if there's a storyline running throughout with all these reoccurring characters, like a, a beat list of characters that keep coming back over and over again it that's just one of the ways and it was kind of a philosophy that i took away from the simpsons and that's what i was going for with this episode so here it is zombies ate my neighbors enjoy once again halloween is upon us i shall again return to earth and wreak havoc upon the helpless <laughs> and you all cower before me well, after my dinner party that is so where are you off to all snazzed up? Well, if you must know, I have a premiere party to attend. So do you think this looks okay? Yeah, sure. I'm not overdoing it, am I? I don't want to look too dressed up or anything. No, you look fine, really. Excellent. So while we're on the subject, how's about taking me up with you? I'm freaking sick of this place. Well, I suppose I could, but just stay out of trouble. Fine, but I'm not making any promises. That's not a ghost, that's a zombie. I think I'm gonna need a bigger gun. Zombies Ate My Neighbors. It was a creepy and unique game released for the Super Nintendo. But if you're looking for a good zombie game to whet your appetite, then keep on looking, because this game deserves to be chucked into the nearest meat grinder. Okay, it may not be that bad, but it does contain a few things that could really piss a gamer off. Now the startup screen does have a cool horror-like movie feel to it. And during the game, you'll be killing more brain-eating zombies than you can shake a stick at. Zombies, zombies, and more zombies. And they turn up in the craziest places too. Castles, tunnels, shopping malls, Barnes and Nobles. Brains, brains. Ooh, the Kama Sutra. Now the main objective in this game is to go around and collect your neighbors before they get eaten alive by brain-eating zombies. But if the zombies get to them before you do, yeah, fuck. The nice thing about this game is you don't have to find every single character in the level in order to finish the stage. And that's a good thing too, because do I really have to save this stuck-up cheerleader? I mean, every cheerleader I ever asked out in high school flat out rejected my ass. Yeah, serves you right, you cunty bitch! Also along the way, you'll be collecting all sorts of weird weapons to use. Some that are odd, and some that are just plain... Uh... Hmm... Way to jack off on the cheerleader, pervert. Now the most ridiculous weapon in this game has to be throwing popsicles. If you throw these at zombies, it'll actually kill them. So exactly how is a frozen treat supposed to be a weapon against the undead? I don't think this is even possible, but I urge everyone to go out and try it to see if it really works. We at the Umbrella Corporation urge caution against throwing popsicles at zombies, as it has no effect. Please throw at your own risk. Now the first few stages are chock full of zombies, 
But after that, they start being replaced by other things, such as mummies, vampires, Frankensteins, aliens, killer dolls, werewolves, sandworms, giant babies, Count Chocula, and tons of other shit that'll eat your neighbors. But what the hell is up with all these other enemies? The title of this game clearly reads, Zombies Ate My Neighbors, not Monsters Ate My Neighbors. So exactly what the fuck is going on here? In fact, the only thing you won't find in this game are skeletons, and I'm not exactly sure why. So heck, why don't we ask one? So joining us live to the Irate Gamer Show, connected by via satellite, Ronnie the Skeleton. Hello Ronnie, how are you? Am I on? Am I on? Oh goodness me! Well, you sure are. Why don't you tell us a little about yourself? Oh goodness me, I can't believe it. I'm a big fan, big fan of yours. Well, my name is Ronnie, and you may remember me from my most memorable role as Skeleton Number 2 in The Legend of Zelda game. It was pretty much my breakthrough performance, and most popular to date. Okay, I could try now, out for a part in this game, but do you believe I never received a callback from Nintendo? I thought it was a dead luck, but I guess I was mistaken. But my agent even said, Ronnie, you've got this thing in the bag. But I guess I might have been typecast for this part, but you okay, won't believe now, how many few acting roles there are out there for skeletons in video games. And oh my gosh, it's just one of those things that makes you scratch your head. I even was also very close to landing the lead role so, in the game Medieval. But wouldn't you believe it, my cousin ended up getting that part? I mean, can you believe it? I was in shock that Hulk got Ronnie, picked over me. Of course I was overjoyed, uh, but Ronnie, obviously I had more experience than him. But then again, Ronnie, I'm not sure if I should feel bitter, because that's the last uh, thing I would do is become a hypocrite of the entire this is, situation. This is not really but then again, out. I do deserve it. At can least we, that's what my mother tells me. And you won't can believe how many people cut, out there think that the I should have gotten <sighs> Holy shit, where the hell was I? The worst thing about this game is that you only start off with three lives in a game that has over 40 stages to fight through. And you're only given a password after you complete every third or fourth level without dying. What a bunch of horseshit. So that means you're gonna have to try your best not to get killed, attacked, eaten, maimed, electrocuted. <gasps> what the fuck? Now let me just warn you that once you reach around level 20, the gameplay switches from killing monsters to solving frustrating puzzles that involve finding keys and hidden rooms. And you'll have to do this all while fighting off the overwhelming horde of enemies. Setting up the game this way just really flips my shit. Well, it appears we have a caller. Which is funny because this isn't supposed to be a call-in show. Alright, caller, you're on the air! Oh, uh, yeah, it's Ronnie! Am I on? Oh, uh, Ronnie! Um... Yeah, we were experiencing some technical difficulties, but uh, we really don't need you right now. Well, as I was saying, it's really hard for me to get a job uh, working Ronnie? at video games these days for the salary Ronnie? I'm looking for. And you think I'm Jewish? Oh boy, that doesn't compare to the guys working at Sony. I once worked 12 oh straight months for them, and I got Can somebody cut the line, please? I mean, I really don't have any groceries the bone. because I don't really eat that cut much, because I do it. have an apartment that... Thank you. Now, once you defeat the last boss, which is a floating scientist's head, you'll then arrive at the last level named the Credit Level. And instead of scrolling some boring credits at the end, we get to run around in the game developer's office as you collect your neighbors one last time. But what the hell kind of an ending is this? Can't we get some kind of closure? Way to fuck up the ending, guys. Especially you, Mark Hutchinson. I think a better ending would have been to find out if killing the last boss actually did something about the zombie problem. As a gamer, this is stuff I need to know. So since they did such a shitty job on this game, Here's a special Ira Gamer fuck you to you! Oh god, it's probably Ronnie again. Well, folks, happy Halloween. I gotta go. Yes, yes! The show is mine! Welcome to the evil Ira Gamer show. Now, the next game we'll be reviewing. Oh, it seems we have a caller. Go ahead, caller. Am I on? Am I on? Oh, goodness me. Well, as I was saying. I, mean, I tried to move on to bigger and better things, but there's not really demand for skeletons and parts of video games these days, unless a new Legend of Zelda game comes out. Alright, so here we are with Tetris, the second episode of Season 2. And it was funny when I did this episode initially, I got a lot of flack for it because they're like, why are you ranting on Tetris? And I th there was a misnomer back when uh, angry reviewers were doing these games back then. You know, if they thought you were ranting on a game, it was instantly bad. And I wanted to break that mold. I'm like, well, no, the good games also can piss you off as well. And I think that was getting lost in the fold. And, and I was like, look, you're calling me a copycat, but I'm trying to do something different here. And the funny thing was, this was probably my most popular episode back then. I ended up... Uh, this episode ended up becoming the 8th 
most watched video on YouTube when I released it. I, I was just blown away. I was like, wow, that is some accolade. This, this was one of my favorite episodes from back then, from back in that era. Uh, and it was funny too, because I used the eggplant wizard sprite at the end. And just to show you how far the haters took the hate for uh, Irate Gamer existing and being, you know, the, the competition to the angry video game nerd, they actually tracked down the person who made this sprite and said, hey, Irate Gamer is using his sprite in your video. You better get mad and, and raise a fuss. And the person contacted me, and I think it was a, a girl, and she was like, I'm not sure what's going on here, but they really have it in for you. I was like, I know, I know, right? So it was just, you know, I put up with so damn much from the haters throughout season two and season three. But uh, here we are with Tetris, one of my favorites. What puzzle game is more widely recognized than the game Tetris? Since the mid-1980s, this game was addictive as it was fun. It was new, original, and widely popular to people around the world. But what does the word Tetris actually mean? And what is a Tetris? Well, believe it or not, this actually comes from the Greek word Tetra, which means segments containing four pieces. And wouldn't you know it, every shape in this game is made up of only four blocks. Cool. Now what's odd is that there are actually two versions of Tetris released for the NES. One made by Nintendo, and the other made by Atari. Now this one's a little harder to come by, but it was made first, so we'll start off with this one. Ah, Tetris, the Soviet mind game. Now before beginning, you'll be able to select your difficulty level. They even give you the option of picking out your own choice of background music. So it's pretty much like a jukebox. Hmm, I wonder if they have anything by Van Halen. Bitchin! Once you begin, blocks will start falling from the sky, so you'll have to try your best to fit these different shapes together until you have filled up the entire row, which then causes them to disappear. Once you get the hang of it, you'll be deleting off multiple rows at once to perform a double, a triple, or even a tetris. It's just a good thing this stuff doesn't happen in real life. Oh fuck! So the rest of the game is pretty much cut and dry. Drop blocks, fit them in the right place, and then repeat. It's a great idea, and it's fun to play. After you've managed to wipe out a certain number of rows, they then give you a small break so they can add up all the points you've collected. During this time, little Russian dancers will then come out and entertain you. Hey, how much are we getting paid an hour? Score really big, and you'll even get the maidens to come out for a bit. Hey, baby! Hey, call me sometime! Once the intermission ends, you begin the next level, and now the blocks start descending even faster than before. And the further you advance in this game, the faster they fall. You've just gotta try your best to find a place for each one, and it becomes a never-ending battle to make sure your next move doesn't screw up your whole entire game. And just look at all these blocks. They just keep dropping down on you, and there's no way to stop it! What the hell? Once you pick this game up, I'm guaranteed you'll be addicted, and probably have a hard time putting the controller down. Now this may be a stupid question, but what the hell is going on over here? Every time a block is dropped, these little bars go up. Now I know when you play a two player game, this side becomes the second player side. But does this stuff actually mean anything? Will something actually happen if I get all these bars to the top of the screen? I'm not sure, but I think it's time we find out. Can you guess what happens next? I mean, I couldn't believe it. Absolutely fucking nothing, you ass biter! How damn pointless was that? Why the fuck is this even here? I mean, why not post a warning for this kind of shit? Something like warning, these bars are fucking pointless. That's all I ask. But why did Nintendo decide to release a Tetris of their own too? Did they want to expand on the existing concept? Or did they just have something to prove? Well, Tetris was created by a guy in Russia in 1985. 
the game quickly crossed into other countries while the copyrights to the game were poorly being kept track of. Four years later, over a dozen companies claimed to have the exclusive rights to produce Tetris, one of them being Atari. After a few legal battles, the courts finally decided that Nintendo was actually the only company who had the exclusive rights to this game. They then forced Atari to pull all their copies of Tetris off the shelves after only four weeks of being on the market. But after this whole ordeal, did Nintendo actually produce a better game? Well, let's find out. Now this game does give you a lot of the same features, but they scaled back on a lot of things. For instance, they now give you only three songs to choose from. One being the song Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy. Just in case your gamer is an inspiring fucking musical conductor. Nintendo also dropped the two-player feature that was popular in the Atari version. What a bunch of shitburgers. Despite all these changes, however, the game still follows the same basic concept. Fitting blocks together and keeping them from reaching the top. But in this version, when the blocks start getting dangerously close to the top, the music starts speeding up. Now this causes me to get nervous and could mess me up. And I shouldn't have to deal with this aggravation because I've got enough to worry about. Dropping blocks, flipping blocks, putting them in the correct place, watching to see what shape is coming next, deleting rows, scoring points, flipping more blocks, putting those in place, and it doesn't stop. The process just keeps increasing in speed until you fuck up and lose the game. Fuck! And it's really annoying because there's nothing worse than having things just dropping down on you. Whoa! Although the Nintendo's Tetris falls a little bit short when compared to the Atari version, it's still addictive as heroin. In fact, I can't get enough of this game. But I have been playing about four hours straight, so maybe I should take a break. Ah, fuck it. I need more Tetris. Give me more Tetris! Bring on the Tetris! Nintendo knew they had a hit on their hands and decided to release a sequel, Tetris 2. This time they took the same concept of laying blocks, but totally revamped the gameplay. First off, we're treated to weird looking shapes not even found in the original. And you see these blocks with black circles on them? Well, those are bombs. Bombs? Afraid so. This Tetris has bombs. Oh shit! Now the only way to delete any blocks from the screen is to match up any three light colors in a single row. And your goal this time around is to make sure these bombs are part of that row. Once you clear the board of bombs, you then can advance to the next level. But why did Nintendo go and revamp a concept that works? Are they insane? Did they actually think this is fun? It makes as much sense as urinating into a radiator. The outcome just plain stinks like piss. Even though this game sucks balls, I can't put it down. So why am I still playing this game if I hate it? You know, I think I'm addicted to Tetris. Well, that's it. I'm stopping right now. I'm going crazy. I need more Tetris. Maybe I can help you out. Eggplant wizard? I've got the stuff right here. Gimme, gimme, gimme. <laughs> ah, Dr. Mario. Now it's time to cure what ails ya. And in my case, it's Tetris Addiction. This is a great game that really takes an interesting twist in puzzle games. Now the level becomes infected by three types of viruses. Red, blue, and yellow. Dr. Mario then throws his pills into the jar, and it's your job to destroy these nasties by matching up four light colors in a single row. And when you wipe out the color, you wipe out the virus. Simple as that. Now it starts off easy, but it gets really frustrating later on. Sometimes you'll accidentally stack colors on top of other colors and screw yourself in the process. Well damn it. Now the background music is where this game really shines. They only give you two songs to choose from, but they're both pretty entertaining to listen to. In fact, I wouldn't mind putting these on my iPod. This game is pretty awesome, and I can't even think of one thing that could make it even better. It's fun as hell, and highly addictive. Very, very addictive. Let's play.
I feel like I've been hit by a truck. Well, that's it. No more puzzle games. I'm just gonna sit back today and relax. Let's see, maybe I'll play a game I haven't played yet. Now, here's one. Yoshi's Cookie. Okay, so here we are. The next episode is the Contra Trilogy, which took up two episodes. And man, it took a long time for me to pump out both episodes because one of the time consuming aspects was I was having my friend Eric uh, show up as another new character, which was the Wise Sage, which was kind of like a spin on the Obi-Wan Kenobi character in Star Wars. So every character that kind of showed up was a spin on another character that showed up somewhere else. Uh, again, I, when I reviewed Contra, I had so many people going, why are you hating on Contra? I love that game. I did too, I loved Contra, but man, there were things in that game that I was like, what in the hell? Oh, this pisses me off. So I was, I was still trying to break through that wall of look, every game I rant on is not crap. Uh, fun fact, I was actually, uh, when I did the initial script, I was going to add the Sega Genesis version of Contra in this review as well, but time got me. I was spending so much time piecing this thing together. I was like, you know what? I, I don't even need the Sega stuff. I'll just cut it and because I can go Contra 1, 2, 3, Contra Force, and then uh, Contra 4, you know, going to the major ones uh, held by Nintendo at least. And it just, it just flowed, I think it flowed a lot better that way because my the the Contra game that I had for Sega just went off into weird territory. So that's why it got cut. Uh, and it, you know, one thing I look back to on this episode is I remember distinctly ranting on how Contra Force was, uh, you, you could pick up a copy for $40. You know, this was a time where you could go, you could still go to garage sales and places like that and pick up a box of Nintendo games for like 20 bucks. And these were some you know, major hit titles. You can't do that today. So it's kind of funny looking back and, and, and looking at the, me ranting on this game being $40 because I think it's tripled, quadrupled in tr uh, price since then. And uh, which a lot of games have. So it's just funny you know, reminiscing and thinking about this in hindsight, like $40, you know, you expect to pay that for a lot of NES games now. But yeah, Contra Trilogy took a lot of time to put this one together, and uh, I hope you enjoy. If there ever was a game that made a huge impact on the NES, it was the game Contra. The gameplay was groundbreaking for its time, and what made it so popular is that the game offered the option of two players playing simultaneously. And the guns? The guns were just awesome. Machine guns, laser guns, spray guns, guns I don't even know the name of. Hell yeah! Take that, you bitches! There were tons of enemies throughout each level just waiting to kill you. So it was just nice to know that you could upgrade your weapon at certain points of this game. But even though this game is awesome, it still had its share of flaws. First off, where's the backstory to this game? They start off by dropping you on some remote island to fight off tons of bad guys. So why am I even fighting here? Is there a specific reason for this? I guess there could be an explanation in the instruction manual, but the hell with that. Who the hell ever reads those things anyway? I can't waste my time reading about a game, I just gotta play it. Now judging by the title of this game, I think it's pretty obvious what your mission objective will be. But I do wonder what transpired before this game even began. Sir, we have a situation. Report. Our contacts have reported that an island out in the Atlantic Ocean is under lockdown and is now being controlled by rogue terrorists. Good God. Wake the president. Of course, the 8-bit translation would look a little bit more like this. I forget it. This is just too painful to watch. 
Now it's pretty obvious that the military decided to send some troops in to defeat the bad guys. But whose bright idea was it to send in only two men into enemy territory and face a shitstorm of rogue terrorists by themselves? Just who the hell is commanding this operation? Gomer Pyle? Well, golly! But even though you're outnumbered by a million bad guys to one, there is one way you can even things up a bit. During the game, if you shoot one of these boxes, or shoot down one of these blimps, you'll most likely receive a weapon upgrade. And all the upgraded guns end up being really helpful. Well, except for this one. This laser gun will only travel a few inches from your player if you keep pressing the fire button way too fast. Ugh, what a piece of shit this thing is. If you see it just sitting on the ground, avoid it like the fucking plague. Because if you touch it, you're as good as dead. Now this game could be loads of fun, but prepare to give your fingers a real workout. Every gun in this game, except for the machine gun, requires you to press the fire button repeatedly in order to keep shooting bullets. Well shit! Looks like I'm gonna need a turbo controller. Now if you decide to play a one player game, then play at your own risk, because these levels can be somewhat difficult. And that's mainly due to the game giving you only three lives and three continues to work with. Once you're finished, that's it. Game over. And if you decide to continue, they make you restart at the beginning of the level. Well, let's try this one more time. just too freaking hard. Well, that's it. I give up. Use the code, Luke. What? The code. Use the code. Oh yeah, the code. Thank you, Wise Sage. You're welcome, Luke. Uh, my name isn't Luke. Oh, really? Oh, this is embarrassing. Well, I gotta go. So what is this code, you ask? Well, amazingly enough, the developers of the game included a code that would give you 30 lives to start out with. And this code is considered infamous by most old school gamers out there. Alright, let's do this. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, start. Yes! Oops. I should probably switch over to the startup screen first. Ah, here we go. And it also might be a good idea to have a second player helping out. I'll just get one of my friends to play. Hey guys? Hello? Anyone? Maybe I can help. Hey, thanks for coming back. I could really use your help. Let's do this. Alright, let's tag team this bitch. The coolest feature in this game by far is the ability to play two players at the same time. And adding a second player really helps out in clearing out the board of enemies. And you'll also be able to kill off the ending bosses a lot faster as well. Now there is only one drawback of having a second player, and it's on this third level. If one of the players jumps too far ahead of the other, the bottom ledges will disappear beneath you and you'll fall to your doom. Damn it! What the hell, man? Cut it out! Shut your pie hole, slowpoke! What's great about this game is that all the ending bosses are unique and interesting to fight. I just can't wait to see what kind of ending boss is waiting for us at the end of level 3. Okay, now just wait a minute here. There are aliens in this game? What the shit? I thought I was fighting a terrorist war. Now I'm fighting an alien war? Wow, I've been seriously misled. Although if I did take a closer look at the Nintendo game itself, I guess the huge alien in between the two guys is a dead giveaway. Now you might think that a game like this would get boring and repetitive after a while, but each stage introduces new enemies and elements to keep the fun factor at an all time high. Once you arrive at the final level, you'll find yourself in the alien's hideout. 
and there, you'll encounter a huge enemy that looks like something out of the movie, Alien. And the similarities between the two are pretty darn close. But the worst thing about this level is these fucking cotton ball things. They chase you around the level until they kill you. And it doesn't matter if you manage to kill one of them, because there are five more right behind that one. What the hell, man? Just leave me alone! At last you reach the final boss, and surprise, it's a big gigantic heart. Wow, what a major lack of creativity. But he is pretty easy to kill, so just keep blasting away at him, and he'll die pretty quickly. So after destroying the final boss, and conquering all eight stages, the island blows up, and peace is finally restored. It also turns out that you not only save planet Earth, but the entire universe as well. Wow, the whole freaking universe? And to think that the war was won by the military only sending in two guys to try to derail the whole operation. But the taste of victory would be short-lived, because as it turns out, the aliens weren't fully defeated, and they would be planning a second attack. Luke? Luke? Now, I'm not a marketing genius or anything, but how would anyone know this is a Contra sequel by just looking at the cover? Ah, fuck it, let's just get to the game. After being dropped out of a helicopter, your mission begins, and the game really doesn't make any major strides in either the gameplay or the graphics, so everything should look and feel very familiar to you. Now, if you thought the first game was hard, then you ain't seen nothing yet. Because each level you reach throws more enemies at you than ever before. For the sequel, they pretty much made the same game, but doubled the amount of enemies. I mean, just look how many guys they have coming at you! Just where am I supposed to run from something like this? Maybe if I had a controller for a hand, I'd have a sporting chance at this game. All I can say here is that the aliens are back with a vengeance, and they're throwing everything they have at you to make sure you don't make it out alive. And the aliens pretty much come at you from every direction! Ow! Fuck! But I'm not kidding when I say you have a lot of shit to deal with. The odds really become stacked against you in this game, and it's shit like this that makes things even worse. Oh come on, just how the hell am I supposed to reach that? And it's not like I could just jump up there and get it, because I can't even jump that high! Don't they know that white men can't jump? Now since this game has increased in difficulty, you would hope that they kept the 30 lives code around, but no such luck, because it's gone. Instead, they replace it with a different code that only gives you 10 lives. Did they really expect me to beat this game with only 10 lives and 3 continues? Yeah, right! What I need is a genie. A game genie, of course. And how do you get one? By rubbing a magic lamp! <laughs> it worked! Alright! Okay, genie, for my first wish, I wish for infinite continues. Now I'll just add the secret code and get a second player to play! Hey, wise sage! You're just in time. I could really use your help. I thought you might. So what's the plan? Well, we've got to save the Earth from another attack. Count me in. Let's kick some alien ass. Having a second player in this game is pretty much a requirement if you're planning on reaching the end. Plus it even helps out in places like level 3, where enemies seem to be jumping out of every fucking pixel just to kill you. Oh my god, they just keep coming! Super Contra has a total of 8 levels to fight through. And just like before, you won't have to fight off any aliens until the last couple of levels. Now you'll be seeing all kinds of different creatures, but did they really need this many? When you encounter them, they come at you full throttle with everything they have. God, these guys are out for blood! Whoa. This level really keeps you on your toes, especially in this area, where the ceiling keeps falling down on you. And it really wouldn't be much of a problem if these aliens would stop coming down six at a time. Just look at this shit. Fuck! I swear this level has more aliens in it than the most likely spaceport. Ah uh, yes, I agree. Once you reach the ending boss, the creature waiting for you is some sort of weird looking alien head on top of a woman's head. And I'm not sure if this is supposed to be disgusting or kinky. Well, no matter. Let's just kill this bitch. Alright, we won! 
Well, my work here is done. Farewell, my friend. Once you beat the game, the helicopter flies away, and the day is saved once again. At least I think it is. I'm really not sure because the game doesn't fucking tell me. After all the hard work one has to endure to complete the game, the only thing you find out is that someone gave a special thanks to the Super C team. Yeah, and here's a special thanks from me too, Super C team. Thanks for the spectacular ending, and thanks for filling every level of this fucking game with a fuckload of enemies. And thanks for taking the fucking three lives cut away from you, you bastards. Now there was only one more Contra game released for the NES, and that was called Contra Force. If you're lucky enough to find one today, you'll most likely spend at least $40 for it. Damn, $40 for an NES game? For that price, you'd think it'd be one incredible game, right? Well, let's find out. Uh, did I just put the wrong game in? What the fuck is this? This isn't Contra, and it looks absolutely nothing like it. So where are the blimps? And the aliens? And why have two of the main characters of the Contra series been replaced by four other people I've never even heard of? If I didn't know any better, I swear they just took a random game and slapped the fucking Contra logo on it. And you know what? That's exactly what they did. What? Cue the music! This game right here was originally supposed to be released in Japan under the name Arc Hound. But for whatever reason, it just became another throwaway game that got rejected. Konami then decided to buy the license and release it in the US. After doing so, they slapped the Contra logo on the startup screen, and voila, Contra Force was born. What really boggles the mind is how nothing from this game was altered before including it into the Contra family. Now the same kind of thing did happen with the Super Mario Bros. 2 game, but at least Nintendo had the decency to replace the main characters with Mario characters. You know, I just wonder how many unsuspecting people bought this game just because the Contra logo was on the cover. Boy, were they in for a big surprise. When starting the game, they give you the option of choosing any four of the new characters. And one feature that ends up being really cool is being able to switch out your characters during any point of this game. And when you switch out your character, you'll even switch out his life count. If you lose a life, no problem. Just switch over to someone else who has plenty of lives left. But the one thing that really sucks is if the character loses his last life, the game ends. This even happens if all the other players still have lives left. What a shit flipper. Another feature they added was that they allowed the game to take control of a second player to fight alongside you. Now this may sound awesome, but it really isn't, because they ended up fucking this up too. You see this counter down here? Well, the computer controlled soldier is only given 5 seconds to do his thing before he disappears. What a pointless piece of shit feature this turns out to be. Just what the hell is he supposed to accomplish in 5 seconds? You know, it would have been nice if he stayed around at least until he got shot or something. And look at this shit. Half the time he ends up firing in the wrong direction. Uh, wrong way, dumbass. Fuck, no wonder this thing never got released in Japan. Even though this isn't a Contra game, the one thing that it does live up to is the difficulty level the Contra series offers. One of the main reasons this game is so hard is due to the length of these levels. In fact, they end up being about three times longer than the ones in Contra. And since it only takes one shot to kill you, it doesn't take much to send you back to the beginning of the level. Ah, fuck! I've had enough of this bullshit! Game Genie, I wish to be invincible. Now there are only five levels in this game, and as much as I hate to admit it, some of them are actually fun. They really put some interesting concepts into this game. Like this, for instance. You end up crossing the river to reach a submarine. Yeah, that's pretty cool. But I think the fourth level is probably the coolest level in this game. The object of this level requires you to jump from airplane to airplane. And I gotta say, it's pretty darn unique. Even though the jet sounds have been directly lifted from the game Top Gun. Ah well. Now the third level, on the other hand, is just a huge pain in the ass. It ends up being one of those types of levels where you gotta climb higher and higher until you reach the top. And if you make one wrong move, you fall all the way to the bottom and have to start over again. God, I hate these types of levels. Come on. There we go. Jump over here and... What the fuck? Did that platform just explode? What the fuck is that about? 
But the most baffling thing about this game has to be the ending. The game tells you that the guy you are trying to rescue is still missing. Still missing? What the hell kind of a half ass ending is this? And the situation is still unresolved? Are you fucking kidding me? When a game tells you in a roundabout way that you've just wasted your time beating it for nothing, you know you've got a real piece of shit on your hands. Contra clone or not, there's no excuse for this, and it's totally unacceptable. So I guess there's only one more thing to do with trash like this, and that's to burn it. Even though the game Contra Force may have been a phony sequel, the fans would be treated to a third installment, which would be released on the Super Nintendo. Contra 3 had been the sequel fans had been waiting for, but what a great move Konami made by calling it number 3, which pretty much took Contra Force out of the picture. In the opening sequence, the aliens return for a third time, and they start things off by decimating an entire city. Shit! These are some really pissed off aliens, and after a game like Contra Force, who can blame them? During the first few seconds of the game, you'll notice that instead of starting out with a crappy gun like in the first two games, they cut right through all the bullshit and just give you a machine gun. This game also includes new weapons to play around with as well. Heat seekers, flame guns, nukes, and they even revamped the shitty laser gun. A well-deserved upgrade if you ask me. Now you may be asking yourself, is this a hard game to play? You bet your ass it is, but hey, it's a Contra game, what'd you expect? The games in this series always seem to follow along a certain pattern, and this one is no exception. Even on the easy mode, this game has more shit flying around than an exploding porta potty But even though this game is hard, it still has a lot of fun features. You ride around on motorcycles, ride on helicopters, and even climb up walls like a regular fucking Spider-Man. At times, this game really gets difficult to play, with level 5 being the absolute worst. And whoever added this level really needs to be shot. Now the enemies here shouldn't give you too much of a problem, but these ledges on the other hand... SHIT! Whose fucking idea was it to make these ledges so narrow? Another thing in this area I can't stand are these damn whirlpools. If you accidentally touch one, the ground goes spinning and you have no control over which direction you're headed in. My god, talk about your bad cases of vertigo. Now this game only gives you six levels to fight through. But just like in the previous games, they do end up saving the aliens layer for the final level. And just look at this. Remember this thing from the original game? Sweet! I just love these nostalgic moments. Makes me wish I could just capture this moment in a postcard. Yeah, something like that. So after you kill him, the next enemy you come to is the final boss from the second game. I think this trip down memory lane is really wearing itself thin. Even the final boss is just another rehash of a Contra 2 enemy. So did they end up running out of ideas here or what? Ah well, I'll take what I can get I guess. Once you defeat the game, a helicopter then picks you up and flies you to safety. But instead of getting a well deserved ending, you end up with this shit! Are you sharp enough to beat the normal mode? What the fuck? I just spent an hour trying to beat this game and this is my only reward? You asshole! Instead of the game just ending right here, now I've got to waste my time going back and conquering the game in the normal setting. And it's not like I had anything else better to do, but it's just a waste of time. Because even if you do beat the game this time around, you end up with this message. And it pretty much tells you to go back to level 1, beat the game on the hard setting, and then we'll talk turkey. Well you arrogant piece of shit. I'm just determined more than ever to see an ending to this game. And at this point, I'd even accept an ending that says, you just wasted your time with this game, so go fuck yourself, you gaming asshole! Ugh, just give me a fucking ending already, is that too much to ask? Now the only way to get a proper ending in this game is to fight through the hardest setting possible. You'll encounter more enemies than ever before. But let's just cut to the chase here because I'm really getting sick of playing through these levels over and over again. Finally, after beating this game three fucking times, we're treated to an ending to this thing. And it's really nothing spectacular, because it just ends up being a bunch of congratulations BS. Alright, so the ending isn't all that great, but it's still a great game. Now there were a lot of other Contra titles released for the Game Boy, the PlayStation, and even the Sega Genesis. But only one of these games would be worthy enough of calling Contra 4. And this was recently released on the Nintendo DS. This title really turns out to be a pretty decent game. 
and it really takes gamers back to what made Contra fun. Well, I'm done reviewing Contra games, because I'm fucking sick of fighting off aliens. As far as I'm concerned, hope I never see another alien again. Let's just go back to playing some old school video games. Ah, crap. Alright, so here we are with the Cubert episode, and looking back, I'm not sure why the hell I did Cubert. I, I, a lot of times when I did a video game, I had a great storyline or some great jokes in mind. I'm like, you know what, let me, let me do this episode just based on that joke. Uh, so that's a lot of times how I put things together. Probably not the smartest thing to do when you're being an irate gamer reviewer on YouTube, but it seemed to work. And one of the, the April Fool's joke at the very end was I ended up getting another reviewer to do a collab with me, which was uh, What the Buck, uh, Michael Buckley. And back then, collabs were not commonplace. Okay, so when he showed up at the end, it was a big deal. A lot of people were like, what the hell? And it was so funny because the haters are like, Ira Gaming, you suck. What the buck? You are awesome. So I kept laughing. I'm like, oh, you guys, you jerks. So uh, I, I just couldn't win. But uh, another fun fact with this episode was it was this episode was a lot longer than uh, in the script phase than what uh, ended up being the final version. I think I went into Cubert the Qu Cubes edition, and I also went into Cubert three. But I was like, if I have to get this episode out by April 1st, I had to cut all that and, and really haul ass on getting this one done. So, yeah, enjoy, Cubert. It's been over a month since my last review, and I've been told by YouTube that if I don't make a new one, I'm gonna be fired. So, against my will, I'm here to review another game. And this time, we're gonna review Cubert for the NES. Anyone who's ever stepped foot into an arcade is no stranger to this game. And if you owned an Atari, odds are the game was once part of your collection. But I can't help but wonder, what the hell is a Cubert anyway? If we break down the very name itself, we're pretty much left with more questions than answers. It just boggles the mind. Now the objective in this game is to jump on all the squares once to turn them all the same color. And during your mission, you'll encounter all sorts of things that want nothing more to do than to wipe your ass out. Things like snakes, balls, and these upside down assholes who walk around on the wrong side of the cubes. Hey buddy, what the hell you think this is? An a share painting? I don't think so. Now the controls in this game are very different from any other games out there. And they end up becoming a huge pain in the ass. If you press the down button, it doesn't just move you down, it moves you down into the left. And pressing right, moves you down into the right. Wow, talk about confusing. This game ends up requiring a fucking degree in Cubert physics just to master this shit. Half the time you'll end up forgetting what button to press, and you accidentally go leaping right out the side of the fucking board. Ugh. Especially when tons of enemies are closing in on you, and you start nervously jumping around to avoid them. Ah, shit. The enemies pretty much attack you from all sides, and if they manage to catch you, Cubert starts swearing worse than a video game reviewer. And who can blame him? The only thing you have to defend yourself from these guys are these discs located off to the side here. Jumping on these will return you to the top of the pyramid. Sometimes it'll also clear out the board of enemies. Other times, it does nothing at all. So, what good is an item that only works half the time? What a piece of shit! The outcome turns out to be just as random as the results in the game show. Press your luck. Come on, big bucks, no whammies, big bucks, no whammies, stop! Ah! You lost big time! Kiss my ass, bitch! You are a loser! Now if you think that's the end of your troubles, then think again. Because later in the game, this jerk-off appears out of nowhere and hops around and doing all my hard work. Well that's the last straw. Time to show these guys who's boss around here.
My god, there's no end to this madness! And even if you reach the later stages, you then gotta jump on every square twice before advancing. So now I've gotta do twice the work? Well, the hell with that! I'm done with this review, and I'm ending this episode early. If YouTube doesn't like it, then too damn bad. I mean, what's the worst they would do to me anyway? Fire me? <laughs> yeah, right. I like to see him try. What the Bach. Welcome to the Irate Gamer Show, starring What the Bach. Lots of news in the gaming world today, and for all you Tomb Raiding fans, it seems Lara Croft was spotted yesterday and, surprisingly enough, took a page right out of the Lindsay Lohan book. After bar hopping for six straight hours, the big boo bimbo was spotted at 2 a.m. stumbling drunk downtown and shooting up street signs. The cops were called in to arrest her and proceeded to take away her guns. <laughs> Not those guns. It seems like ever since her movie and video game career went down the tube, she's become a regular Britney Spears. Spears. What's next? A shaved head? Being photographed with no panties? Ooh, I was just letting my tomb breathe. I like it when you raid my tomb. <laughs> also in news, you may remember that last year, football player Michael Vick was arrested on charges of illegal dog fighting. Well, it's now been confirmed he was also illegal Pokemon fighting. He denied it being interviewed by reporters, but kept saying it wasn't his fault. He was just trying to collect them all. And finally, the rich heiress Princess P was spotted shopping downtown, of course wearing that same frickin' dress she's been wearing for the past 20 years. Now, I've heard of having a favorite shirt that you can't throw away, but this is ridiculous. Get with the times, girlfriend. Pink Victorian dresses are out. What the fuck? So, what's the deal with Pac Man and Miss Pac Man? Are they like still together? Alright, so next up is the Predator episode, and boy, this was another time consuming episode to put together because there's a lot of storyline in this one. And, you know, if you ask me again why there was only eight episodes in series season two, is because I I was placing quality over quantity. And putting this episode together was a very lengthy process, let me tell ya. My friend Justin helped me with this episode. He was the guy in the, the Predator outfit. <laughs> it's funny because at the end, he took the he took the outfit off. He was sweating his ass off. I felt so bad for it. I was like, I'll buy you a beer, man. But yeah, there's some great jokes in this. Uh, one being, I was always confused by why the main character was wearing a pink outfit. Like, what the hell? I Of course I had to make fun of that. But yeah, I, I thought it was a great episode. Enjoy. Turning a Hollywood movie into a video game always spells disaster, and Predator for the NES is no exception. This game just isn't bad, it's more like a shit taco with cow urine for a dipping sauce. Once the game begins, you take control of Arnold Schwarzenegger's character, and oddly enough, the only thing you have to defend yourself in this dangerous jungle are your fists. Well, this is an odd move since the cover of the game clearly shows him holding a fucking gun. So I guess I'll just have to beat these guys down with my fists of fury. But if you think these are gonna save your ass, then think again, because they're actually worthless. The worst thing about using your fists is that your attack range is very limited. And to make the gameplay more frustrating, they don't even allow you to punch anything while in the crouching position. What the hell? This makes killing these smaller enemies impossible. All I wanna do is just kill these scorpions, but the game doesn't let me. Ah, this sucks. And while we're at it, why the hell is Arnold running around in a pink uniform? Has the military gone fucking colorblind? Who wears pink uniforms on covert operations? No wonder everybody's trying to kill the guy. He sticks out worse than a sore thumb. Hell, I'm getting the urge just to kill the guy myself. Now, just in case you're wondering, yes, there are weapons in this game, but you have to actually go out of your way just to pick them up. Like these grenades down here, for instance, which turn out to be the shittiest weapon in the game. The main problem is that they don't explode on impact, or upon landing, and since the enemies are always running around, trying to kill them becomes harder than a two-week-old piece of shit. Even trying to blow up a simple wall becomes a complicated mess. Since the blast radius of these grenades are so small, you're only able to blow up one block at a time. 
and if you toss in another one, it just blows up the block right next to it. So how is this a useful weapon? What the shit, muchacho? These grenades just really suck ass. Or should I be saying these pines suck ass? Ugh, whatever. Now if you're looking for a real weapon to fight with, you'll finally be able to pick a gun up in level 3. I'm not sure why this doesn't appear earlier in the game, but the way they treat it as a special item that you have to randomly find just pisses me off. And did I just read that correctly? This is a laser gun? When the hell did Arnold use a laser gun in the movie? Well, I'm not sure which weapon sounds more ridiculous, the laser gun or the pine. How about giving me a boot so I can shove it up someone's ass? And oddly enough, after you go through all the trouble of acquiring your weapons, they then take them all away once you complete the level. Why do I have to go through the extra aggravation of having to recollect items I already had in the first place? It's bad enough I had to go out and find the gun, but now I've got to go and find it again? What a shit flipper! The only positive thing I can say about this game is that they give you a very large pyrometer to start off with. But even having a meter twice that size won't be able to save you from the crazy shit that lies ahead. Once you reach the third level, make sure you tread lightly here, because if you're not careful, you'll fall right through the fucking landscape! Damn it! Half the blocks in this level aren't even solid, and you only find out which ones aren't after it's too late. And the worst part is that this level is filled with the most ridiculous enemies I've ever seen. Things like jellyfish, ghosts, amoebas, and seahorses, all which is not even found in the fucking movie. These things aren't even found in a normal cave for that matter. Wouldn't it have made more sense to use enemies like bats or snakes? I mean, hell, if we're just gonna pick things at random here, why don't we add some cows or sharks or Richard Simmons' workout tape for the hell of it. At the end of level 4, you finally meet up with the Predator, and you shouldn't be too hard to kill, unless you forgot to pick up the laser gun a few screens back. I mean, all you had to do was fall in the correct place, make a series of jumps without falling, and make it past three enemy-filled screens without dying. Shit! And you better hope that you can grab the gun, because just throwing grenades at the guy has no effect. Neither does your overrated Fist of Fury. So, after you successfully kill the Predator, does that mean you win and the game is over? Well, not quite. Yeah, there was only one Predator in the movie, but unfortunately, they decided to add 10 extra Predators to the game for you to kill. I mean, shit, 10 extra Predators? Makes you wonder if anybody working on the game actually saw this movie. You ever get the feeling like you're being watched? Another thing that just pisses me off is all the precision jumping you have to do in this game. In this screen alone, there are 9 small platforms that you have to jump on. Above that screen is an area with 8 ledges, and above that is another with 10. So that means if at any point you make the slightest mistake while climbing up these ledges, you fall down below. Over jump your target, you fall down below. Under jump your target, you fall down below. An enemy hits you, you fall down below. And all my hard work up until this point goes right down the fucking tubes. And it's a long way down, buddy. Who knows where the hell you'll turn up. What the hell was that? This game has over 30 levels to explore. And for some reason, a few of these have been called Level Big Mode. And I guess it's called that because everything is big in this level. Well heck, if we're going to start labeling these levels for what they really are, let's just call a few of these stages Level Piece of Fucking Shit. And we can start by renaming this level. Just look at this shit! Damn blocks! Damn enemies! Shit! And no matter how many times you kill the guys, they just come right back to life! Uh, what the fuck? Get away from me! Ah! Uh, you fucker, I'll kill you! What a piece of shit this game is! It's not even close to the movie! Well, this game sucks. And just don't go near the thing because it absolute. What the hell? Uh oh!
Okay, so here we are. We're coming down to the last set of episodes, which was the Rob the Robot two-part episode. Uh, but before getting to that, I want to mention that I was actually working on an episode before that one, which was uh, an episode called The Kool-Aid Man, which, as you know, showed up in season three. Well, it was actually, I th and I think I was working on it before Rob the Robot. I was working on this episode, and I was getting up to the very end. I had this thing almost complete, edited together, and my computer just crapped out on me. Got the blue screen of death. I was devastated. I'm like, oh my god, I've almost got this thing done. And like I said, I was spending, um, it was not uncommon for me to spend a month or two on these episodes. So I had poured my heart and soul into this, this damn thing and the computer went bust. I took it to like three uh, recovery places. They couldn't figure out a way to get to extract the information off of there. And the last time I backed up my computer was before I started working on this episode. I'm like, gosh, damn it. So I was so mad. And after something like that happens, you know, you're very disheartened. I'm like, you just gotta walk away from it. So I, I spent a couple weeks where I'm like, what the hell am I gonna do? And so I, I think I there was a pe time period where I started pumping out a lot more Ira Gamer Neo episodes because there were so I could I could do those in like two or three days. I didn't care as much about those, but with the Ira Gamer episodes, you know this was especially when it came to the Rob the Robot episode. We're coming to, into an era where I was starting to really flesh out the the script. Uh, now with season one. You know, I would just record that shit and go, slap it together and be like, okay, whatever. But by the time the Rob, Rob the Robot episode come out, you know, I was going through all the audio. I was like, okay, that didn't work. Let me re-record it, you know, 50 times over if I had to. And it was just such a long and daunting process. I'm like, it just took so much time. So Rob the Robot episode, I have I kind of foreshadowed doing this episode in the Predator. Uh, I think it was the Qbert episode where I showed, I was strangling the Rob the Robot because I, I, you know, I had the script all ready to go. It was just a matter of, of recording it. And, you know, I had recorded some things here and there. It took me so long to put this episode together because if you watch it, there's a lot of special effects. You know, uh, Rob the Robot, he's flying around. He's got little rocket boosters. That took so damn long. And of course I was using my janky computer. Um, and at this time, I think uh, if you notice the video quality between the Predator episode and the Rob the Robot episode, I think I got a new computer or I upgraded my software or both because uh, the, the, the quality of the image looks better. So I think that's what was going on there. But uh, I think with the Rob the Robot episode is the first episode where we see a major turning point. I, you know, looking back on it now, that's one of my favorite episodes of season two, if not, no, it, it is the best episode of season two that I did. And I remember when I would go over to a friend's house and they'd be like, what are you up to? And I'd be like, uh, I rate gamer. You gotta see this episode that I did, Rob the Robot. That was my, my go-to episode that I would show people. And you know, they laughed. There was some great jokes in there with the, the FCR, the, the fucker. <laughs> I mean, it just, uh, I looked at those call letters, I'm like, the, the joke writes itself. And I, I just have so many memories of this episode because I work day and night trying to get this damn thing out. And I have so many memories where I was up to like two in the morning re-recording scenes just to make sure everything synced up perfectly. I, I just felt like with this episode, you know, I, I just was firing on all cylinders. I, I just am so proud of this episode. Even even looking back on it now, I'm just like, wow, this was a great episode. So yeah, I spent weeks on this episode making sure it, it's crafted just right. And it was so devastating because I must have released this episode at the worst time because three days prior, ABGN released an episode about the different um, electronics that work with the NES. And at the very end, and I didn't know this, at the very end of his episode, he had Rob the Robot pop up right behind his shoulder to indicate I'm gonna do this episode next. And three days later, I released this episode and the internet went absolutely batshit crazy. <laughs> they were like, irate gamer, you asshole. I can't believe you put this episode out. And I'm just like, what? what's going on? I have no idea. And I'm sitting there like uh, typing to people like, 
I've been working on this episode for like a month. Do you really think I could slap this episode again in three days? I had no idea what James was up to. So yeah, I got, oh man, I really got it then. But um, that aside, I, I really feel like this was an episode that was really strong. Uh, I had to cut it up into two parts because it was so long and I'm like, if I throw all this stuff into one episode, man, I'm gonna be here all year. And I put so much time and effort into this. It's just a perfect episode to close out season two with. Today we're going to look at a very obscure Nintendo accessory that not many people will probably recognize. And that's this guy right here, Rob the Robot. Even though he wasn't as popular as the Nintendo system, his role in bringing it to the US was actually essential. Before the Nintendo was released in the US, the country was going through a video game crash that had occurred in 1983. This was a time when people had stopped playing video games and anything even resembling a video game system was immediately shunned by retailers. So Nintendo decided to pair the NES system up with a robot and market the console as a robot gaming system rather than a video game system. And to everyone's surprise, the plan worked. Now the robot they ended up using was called a Robotic Operating Buddy, or Rob for short. Rob's main function was to act like a second player during certain games made for the robot. But one of the drawbacks to this item was the lack of games made for it. Out of almost the 700 games produced for the NES, only two were made specifically to work with Rob. So basically Nintendo just used this thing to break it big, then chucked his ass in the trash can once his purpose was fulfilled. I mean, I'll probably end up doing the same thing, but come on, only two games? Way to fuck over the consumer. Now the robot was first released in Japan with a red and white color scheme, and that was called the Family Computer Robot, or the fucker for short. And the one released in the US was called the Rob, and the colors were changed over to a grayish tone in order to match the colors of the NES system. Just in case you need to camouflage it for some odd reason. But besides the different color schemes, the two robots are identical. Now along with the robot comes a whole shitload of accessories. And these fit along the numbered slots located around the base. The robot comes with two spinning gyros, a piece to hold the gyros, a gyro spinner, and a special control pad accessory that allows Rob to play games with you. But I can't help but wonder why the base is numbered, but these pieces aren't. I mean, a little numbering system would have been nice so I can just set this thing up for optimal performance. I mean, after all, this is a highly technological piece of shit we're dealing with. Now to operate this thing, you're gonna need a shitload of batteries. Now I just gotta find some. The robot alone needs four AA batteries to work. Then on top of that, you'll need a single D battery for one of the accessories. Damn, this is getting expensive. Okay, so the first one we're gonna look at is a game called Gyromite, which was packaged along with the robot. Now there are a few different modes of gameplay to choose from on the select screen, and the direct mode will help teach you how to control the robot. So let's just start off by doing something simple here and have him press the A button.
that just to press the A button? How is this supposed to be fun? What a piece of diarrhea dick waffles! I get more pleasure by sticking my tongue into electrical socket! The robot turns out to be both slow and noisy. Let's just hope he's better at playing the actual game. In this game, you start off as Professor Gyro, and your mission is to go around and collect the dynamite scattered around the level before the timer runs out. If you fail, the dynamite then explodes and kills off your character. At least I think it kills him. Either that, or else the sound of these things going off in unison gives the old fucker a heart attack. The main obstacle that stands in your way are these red and blue colored pillars. These can only be moved out of your way by pressing the A and B buttons on the second control pad, which is currently being controlled by your robot buddy. But before you can move these things out of your way, it's going to be your job to instruct them on which way to move. So after you press the start button, the screen will turn blue, and the first controller becomes the command hub for controlling your robot. For instance, pressing up will make a move up. Pressing down will make a move down. Pressing the A and B buttons will open and close his arms. And pressing the party button makes him get jiggy with it. Jiggy with it. All the commands are sent to the robot by a series of flashes created by the game. The only drawback to this is that sometimes the robot doesn't even respond to the flashes, so you end up sitting there like a fucking putz waiting for him to move. Come on! During your quest to collect dynamite, you'll probably notice that the professor isn't able to jump or attack enemies. So if you come into contact with an enemy, you're fucked! If you fall into a hole that has no way out, you're also fucked! Well, shit! Now, I'm sure they probably did this to make this game more challenging, but I do find it interesting how the A and B buttons on the first controller really have no function at all. It appears that the developers of the game took both the A and B functions off the first controller and just threw them onto the second one in order to get the robot involved. Well, this is just an ass load of shit! Why ruin a good game by splitting up the buttons between two controllers just to add in a stupid robot? This in turn makes the game longer to play, and ends up boring the player out of his fucking mind while he waits for the prick to move! Just look how much faster I can finish this level all by myself compared to playing with the robot. Ugh, this is just pathetic. Can you imagine playing Super Mario Bros. where the jump button is on the second controller? The suicide rate in this country alone would go through the fucking roof! One way the robot add-on becomes an absolute nightmare is during these critical moments when the enemy is closing in on you. Come on! Ah! Ah, you dickbag! You're the worst player I've ever played with! Alright, let's try this again. Did you just squish my player? You better shape up or your ass is out of here! Now on top of not being able to jump or attack, you're not even able to call on the robot while climbing up ropes. This really becomes annoying after climbing to the top and realizing that the screen isn't turning blue. Ugh, so now I've got to climb back down while the seconds on the clock are ticking away. Oh, and it's always fucking ticking away. It's something that the slowest robot just doesn't realize, and I have to wait for a scrawny ass to hurry the fuck up! And come to think of it, this game kind of resembles Donkey Kong Jr. Like how you climb up a bunch of ropes and can't attack the enemy. Heck, a couple of what place pillars, and this game would have been a dead ringer. Yeah, take that you Mario fuck! The most annoying aspect about this game is trying to kill enemies, because it involves precision timing. This simple task is made a billion times harder, since the robot responses are severely delayed. Okay, now! Shit! Damn it! Shit! Ah! Damn it, robot! I'll just do it myself! Finally! Now if you think that's the end of your troubles, then think again, because over in this area, I've got to figure out how to weave through these four pillars as fast as possible. Alrighty, this is going to take some doing. Okay, grab the first gyro, take it to the spinner, get it spinning nice and fast so it doesn't fall over. Good. Place it here. Alright, first pillar down. Go back, grab the other one, spin around here, 
Ah, this is taking too long. Spin this one too, releasing here. Sweet, second pillar down. Now I've gotta go back and lift this. Good, almost there. Come on. Ah shit, time's running out. Come on, hurry it up! Ah, this place is gonna blow! Okay, now grab the dynamite. Run over here and... Ah, what the fucking shit! These again?! Shit, you made me lose! Now there's only one more game that works with the robot, and that's called Stack Up. And along with this game, comes brand new attachments for your robot. Now these pieces are pretty hard to find these days, and they could be quite expensive to purchase. So if you ended up selling yours off at a garage sale at some point in time, then guess what? You're pretty much an idiot. Now Stack Up gives you three games to choose from, and each one of these games all have this two-tiered configuration at the top. The first column tells you how the block should be placed around your rob. The second column tells you where the block should be moved in order to beat the level. This ultimately becomes your main objective in each of these three games. Now the first game we're going to look at is called Direct. Now this game is composed of command buttons that you have to jump on in order to move the robot around. And each button is pretty much self-explanatory. Down moves him down, up moves him up, nothing really mind-blowing here. Now your goal is to keep moving the robot around until the second column of blocks looks identical to the one sitting around the robot. But this is a totally asinine concept due to the fact that the game doesn't really know if I've completed my task or not. In fact, I only have to press the start button to let the game know that I'm finished. Well that's fucking stupid. Even if you're nowhere near completing your task, the game still believes that you're done. So where the hell's the fun in that? How pointless. So the first game totally sucks ass. Now the second game is called Memory. This game requires you to guess the entire sequence of movements the robot has to make until the blocks around them can match up with the ones in the second column. And make sure you really plan out everything exactly because you're only given one shot to get things right. Once you lay down the end button, that's it. The game begins and the robot starts carrying out the line of commands. Okay, let's try this out. No, stop! No! Shit! You stupid robot! Well, the verdict's in. The second game also sucks ass. So at last, we come to the final game called Bingo. And as shocking as this might sound, this one's actually fun. The biggest problem with the other games is that the robot moves so slow that it leaves a lot of time for players to get bored. But this game actually fixes that problem. Now the only way to move Rob is by jumping on all the buttons in a single row. Only then will the robot perform a function that's located off to the side. Now there are two different enemies working against you in this game. And if you get too close to this one, he'll bounce your ass right off the fucking screen. Ah, you prick! Now the other enemy can actually press down on the buttons too, and makes Rob move in directions you don't want him to. If you're not careful, this enemy can create all kinds of problems for you. No, not the party button! Oh. Well, that pretty much covers the games on Stack Up, so let's go ahead and recap here. We've got two games that totally suck, a slow ass robot that helps make these games suck, and the only way you can win is by telling the game that you've won. This game just isn't Stack Up, it's also fucked up. Well, that's pretty much it, because besides these two games, Rob the Robot's pretty much useless. Where'd he go? You 
got to be shitting me. <laughs> 